Good morning. Well, were you a little surprised this morning to hear the kids say that they've seen someone with a cup asking for money? This, this tall? I mean, you think they didn't notice when they were with you? They weren't aware of what was going on? How many times have we seen this or seen like it? Uh, it's very, very common. And it's as old as Acts chapter 3. And I have a hunch, probably older than that. So when we, in our series, This Changes Everything, is there something that can change that scene? Is there anything about the death and burial and resurrection of Christ and the preaching of the gospel that makes it where no one needs to beg? Hold that thought. We'll come back to that. The passage we're going to look at today, uh, I, was, I was going to primarily be in Acts chapter 5. I'm going to start in Acts chapter 4, verse 33, and then we're going to go back uh, to the scene that, that uh, I just referred to. As a theme, I think the power of Jesus' resurrection was, was the catalyst, was the inspiration for the phrase, abundant grace was upon them all. Those are actually stated in the same two phrases, one right after the other, in Acts chapter 4, verse 33. So abundant grace was upon them all. And it caused some changes. And interestingly enough, right after Peter preaching on Pentecost and everyone responding to the message of the gospel. The very next day, it seems, there's a man at the temple, and he's begging. Now, he's been there all along, okay? That's real clear from the passage. Everyone knew that when they went to the temple, they were going to encounter this man who could not walk, and therefore he could not work, and therefore he needed the charity the good graces of the people who passed by to go to the temple every day to give him enough to eat today. And so we'll begin in Acts chapter 3, verse 3. When Peter and John, about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. Now, i, I got to pause there because when you ask and ask and ask and ask and you get turned down and turned down and turned, you, you start not looking. You understand? You, you understand what that looks like? Because you've seen it, right? The man's asking, but he's not looking. And they say, look at us. That's, there's something really authentic about that description that Luke gives us. And he began giving them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. So if you want me to look at you, you're going to do something, right? And so as I told the kids this morning, Peter said, I don't possess silver or gold. I don't have money. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And he does. And he's running around leaping and praising God and the temple police are not happy again. And then we go through two chapters of what happens when, you, when you're nice to someone and the temple officials aren't happy. They haul you in and they question you and they try to make fools out of you and they try to tell you stop doing what you're doing and all kinds of stuff happens. And immediately after we get through with that story, we find ourselves at the end of, of chapter 4 kind of like there wasn't a break in the story. And it's, and it's almost another summary, like we looked at last week, you know, the Acts 2.47 that we very often quote. You know, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking bread and prayer. We talked about all that last week. Well, in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, it's almost like we're reading it again. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. 
And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. Now here's, here's a phrase I want you to hear. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds of the sales, and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. I, <laughs> I know where I'll have to explain that phrase to you, and then I'll show you a passage in the Old Testament that's basically been quoted. But what I just read indicates that after the resurrection of Jesus, in the early days of the church, it was at the place where the first thing that happened was we heal the man who has to beg. And by the time we get through with getting in trouble for that, the phrase could be stated, there was not a needy person among them. Now before you say, well, yeah, but you know, that, they were just a few back then. Do you remember how many were baptized? 3,000? And we, and we get to the place real quick where we stop counting after 5,000? In fact, the, the population of Tulsa and the population of Jerusalem swelled at that feast time. There, there were actually probably more people there than here. So if you can imagine a time and place where there are no beggars, And let me very cautiously say, because the church was doing its job. I want you to tune into this, because I believe this is one of the things that changed at the resurrection of Jesus. Now, this isn't a sermon on charity. In fact, it's quite complicated. The more I dug, the more I found, and I, and I began to question if I could even cover it in one lesson. But what that passage that we just read seems to say is that the congregation who believed, and I'm going to use these three words, they were gathered around faith. The congregation who believed. What caused them to come together? The faith that they had. And we're told that the preaching was about the resurrection. So we're really what we're talking about is these people believed that Jesus was raised from the dead, that he was alive, that he was watching, that he, shall we say, hadn't gone far. And that's what was propelling everything. And in the congregation, they were of one heart and soul. And what that caused, according to this passage, is that they were open-hearted in that grace that was abundant. And they got to where they quit caring about whether it was mine or yours, the question was, do you need it or do I need it? And that, that was really about the only question to be asked. And so they were voluntarily, and, and this came from the congregation. This was not a requirement on the day of Pentecost. This was not a requirement that Peter and, and the apostles began to teach. Now everybody has to sell everything and we've got to put it all together because we're communists. No, that's been preached. That's patently wrong, as we'll see. These people were voluntarily liquidating their assets and they were meeting needs with the proceeds of lands and houses being sold. Now I want to go back to Deuteronomy because that phrase is right out of this passage and I'm going to, I'm going to preach on this tonight. If you want a further discussion about the poor and in the church and out of the church and what do we do and how do we do it, I'm going to go back to Deuteronomy and look at about 15 verses with you tonight. But in Deuteronomy, Moses said, however, there will be no poor among you, since the Lord will surely bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, if only you listen obediently to the voice of your God. Well, apparently, Luke, who's very aware of this passage in the Old Testament, it's the words of Moses, a very strong value among the Jews. 
he says practically the same thing. There was not a needy person among them. What's being reflected here is that grace has changed everything. Actually, I backed off the word everything there because I think there's more than grace involved in this. But grace has changed their ability to see needs. What happens now? Well, you're going to the temple. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I got to go to the temple. I, you know, I can't, I can't be seeing needs. I don't have time for that right now. This is back to the parable of Good Samaritan, right? Priest and Levite, they go by on the other side. If you can't see needs, then you don't have to take care of them. And if you look the other way, and he doesn't look at you, then maybe you get by and you keep everything in your pocket. Well, grace just doesn't allow that. Grace says, wait a minute, i, I got to notice things that are needed. And grace changed their view about how bad they needed houses and land. I, I don't understand that dynamic exactly. And again, this wasn't required, this wasn't put on them. This is something they voluntarily did. It, it just came out of the grace that was flowing freely because of the resurrection of Jesus. And so their, their way of looking at what they own changed. Their openness then to be recipients of blessings changed. Now, I say that because I can remember most of my life this phrase that, that we use, I don't take no charity. You ever heard that? Well, you may not like being in need, but if you're in need, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's just the way it is. It doesn't make you less a person. Peter and John didn't say, well, you know, I, I, we're going to let you walk so you can be a real person like the rest of us. No. It may have felt that way. But, but that's not the issue. And so if you're in need and someone's willing to sell their property and make sure that you can eat tonight, you don't say, I'd rather starve and take your money. There's no grace of Christ in that. So it's the giving and the receiving that takes a change. See? And they're laying this money at the feet of the apostles. And, and this is a response to the spiritual leadership of these who are preaching and teaching. Every day and we're with Jesus. I don't understand this dynamic completely, but it's clear that this is what happened. And I think it applies to today. Now, <laughs> the text goes now to two examples. Because when you read that they were selling things and they were laying it at the apostles' feet, you don't, you don't really have a picture of what that looks like. So, Luke is going to give you two examples of what that looks like. Good and bad. Now, I'm going to read these together, one right after the other, because if you get to the end of chapter 4 and you stop and you say, okay, the next chapter is different, wrong, you'll notice it's, it's almost like one complete thought. And so here's how it begins, and, I, and I'm skipping a few words. Barnabas, which translated means son of encouragement, owned a tract of land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself, with his wife's full knowledge, and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. You see how all that's just one thought? I mean, they use all the same words and everything. So you got a good and a bad example. Now I'll just be honest with you, what follows is something that even the commentators struggle with because it's shocking. And it makes us question, why did that just happen? So listen well. But I want to suggest to you that there is a threefold chord that's in operation here. A chord of three strands is not easily broken, Solomon said. There was this resurrection of Jesus that inspired this grace. And, and that was a very strong component in all of this. Then there was this unified, active caring that was going on. I mean, to the point that they're selling assets, things of value, that they can't get back once it's sold. And they're taking care of each other. But there is also absolute sincerity and integrity about all that. 
Everything's being done above board. Nobody's cheating anybody. Nobody's lying to anybody. I mean, the people in need are really in need. Isn't that the first thing that goes through your mind when you drive up on somebody? Do you really need this or am I just feeding some habit of yours? That's the first thing that we think of, right? Okay, so in the church, one of the things that drove this, and this is very important, is there was no question about the need or the integrity of the person who was in need. And therefore, everything was just open and free and the money flowed wherever it needed to go. Now, if you take one of those away, you just messed it all up. And that's what Ananias and Sapphira did. So, let's go back to the text and... Verse 3 of chapter 5, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land while it remained unsold? Did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? You see, that's where I get the voluntary nature of this. Peter does not suggest in any way, shape, or form that Ananias has broken the code or somehow done something that he wasn't supposed to do in the sense of selling, and then how much money goes where it goes. The issue isn't about whether it's okay to sell or not sell, or to give part or all. It, it, it's yours. But then he keeps talking, and things start happening. Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he, Ananias, heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard of it. And the young men got up and covered him up and carried him out and buried him. Now that's pretty stark, wouldn't you say? I, I think it's fair to say, wow. Wow. There must have been more to that than I realized. Oh yeah, probably so. Let me suggest a few things that I can see in the passage. Number one, greed, covetousness, whatever you want to look at, what motivates someone to do what Ananias and Sapphira did, is from Satan. Why has Satan filled your heart? This is satanic. You say, whoa, really? Because I've felt greed before. Yeah, you should watch that. Greed is, greed is huge. And God takes it, pardon my pun, deadly serious. Secondly, this whole idea, whether we go in Acts 2 and they were of one mind, or we go to Acts 4 and they were one heart and one soul, are you seeing those three words and the song we just sang? We're supposed to love God with all of that. It just makes sense that if we're supposed to love God completely with mind and heart and soul, that that being the first commandment is a really big deal. And the nice and Sapphira didn't just, well, they kind of broke one of the commandments. No, they belied the whole foundation of all there is. In the law of Moses and in Christ. Thirdly, Jesus said it this way. Let me explain to you how powerful money is, Jesus says. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon, or money, or wealth, is actually the, the meaning of mammon. If, if you're all concerned about wealth and how much you got, whether you got enough and how long that's going to last, you're going to find your being able to serve Christ is going to be tough. A lot tougher. In fact, you're going to come down to a choice. Ananias and Sapphira apparently came down to a choice. We can serve God. Or we can keep back part of the money. Now, if you're at this point saying, well, there's more to it than that, you're right. And I'm just going to sum it up this way. Lying to leaders is a lie to God. Again, I don't completely understand this dynamic. Peter was just a human being, right? Yeah, okay, he was an apostle. Yeah, the one that denied Jesus. Denied he ever knew. He wasn't perfect. But whatever Peter was as the one of 12 or so who were having these funds laid at their feet, God took that very seriously. It was like taking it 
your offering to the priest, and then the priest going to the altar, and it's worship, it's holy to God. Well, this gift of money was holy too. And so they didn't come and lie to Peter. Peter says, what you did here is you lied to God. You said it was this much, but it was that much. Now, let's look at some other dynamics on the ownership part of this thing, because I think that's also important. Ownership, the concept of can Christians own assets, that's not at risk. That's not an issue. Peter says it himself. You had this, you owned it, it was yours to deal with. That's fine. God doesn't have a problem with that. If you want to sell it and give it, God doesn't have a problem with that. Either way is fine. It doesn't mean that we should all be poor. It doesn't mean we should all sell everything we have and give it to the poor. Jesus told that to one person, and he did it because that guy was trying to serve both. And he said, you got to choose. Which one are you going to do? Ownership is not at risk. How much you give is not the issue. What, what you were going to give was between you and, and God, right? And I, that's not the problem. Boy, you, well, wait a minute. You have to give it all. No, that's not really what he said. It's not how much you give that's the issue. Here's the issue, it seems to me, at least in bulk. Trying to look more spiritual than you are is a big part of the issue. See, what we have here is three instances, one after another, where people, lots of people, sold land and houses, gave it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas sold, laid it at the apostles' feet. If, if you kind of get the drift of this, what everyone was doing is they were putting all the proceeds at the apostles' feet. In other words, they were living just fine, but if they sold this piece of land, then you could eat too, and you could live. And that's how they were doing it. And so Ananias and Sapphira conspired, we're told, various ways in this text. They conspired together, and they decided, we'll look like we gave it all, but we won't. That was the issue. Trying to look more spiritual than you are. Trying to, to be just as generous as everybody else, but don't look behind my back. Now, now let me, please be careful with this. I, I have no doubt in my mind that everyone who's here this morning cares about how they look in front of other people. I know that because you are not looking the way you did when you got out of bed this morning. We all change something. Some more than others. It's important. We, we think that's something that needs to be done. I just texted someone about an hour ago and I said, do I come and get you? And he said, oh, I'm a, I'm a sweaty mess. I said, we have air conditioning. I mean, you know, when you deal with life and death, you don't say, well, I just don't quite look right. Well, <laughs> maybe the important thing needs to happen. Then we worry about all that other. But we do care. And, and when we go to do something for someone, we want to pray, we want to pray at a restaurant, you know, we think about what other people think. That's okay. But when you're trying to lie about how good or bad you are, that's a problem. That's the sincerity integrity issue that was violated here. Now, I don't need to tell you that Sapphira also died. In fact, the words are almost identical in the other half of the story. But what I do want to say to us is the power of accountability in the early church was massive. <laughs> Great fear came over the whole church, you think? I think everyone wanted to know exactly how that should have been done before they went and tried it. This is actually the first occurrence of the word church in the book of Acts. The one in Acts 2 is actually to their number. The Lord added to their number, day by day, those that were being saved. This is the word ekklesia in the Greek for church. And the first use of the word church is everybody was scared. They were in awe. They wanted to be really careful about this giving thing. Because giving is deadly serious. 
there was not a needy person among them was worth having. But it had to all be together. The loving God with all your heart and soul and the unity that that inspired among people to just be overly generous with each other and make sure they noticed if there was any kind of need, they would meet it. But that it be done with sincerity and honesty and integrity. We, we got to take all that serious. And if we don't, then we won't find God's Spirit working so mightily among us as He was in these days. So I was asked as I walked in this morning what I was going to preach about, and I told the gentleman, I don't really want to give you the one word because then you'll walk out. Yeah, we're talking about giving, but are we really? You know, this isn't the building fund campaign. This isn't the mission campaign. This isn't, you know, this sermon isn't about giving and how much and you better, you better give enough or God will get you. Uh, I've heard all those things used, believe it or not, from this passage. This is about hearts right before God and what that causes and that even that still has temptation associated with it. How is that possible? How could something as wonderful as they were of one heart and soul have a tempting side to it? It did. I don't know if Peter knew what was going to happen or not. I kind of think he didn't. That's just me. He's telling Ananias, you, you, you know, you lied, to, you lied to God and Ananias drops dead in front of him. He didn't lift his hand. He didn't pronounce a curse. He didn't do anything but say, here's what you just did. God took care of it. That is a God who works mightily among His people. And that's each person just, just trying to live before God in the best way possible. And so this morning, I, I, I want to ask you to take your faith, your belief in the Christ who is raised from the dead, and in the gathering of His people, because as we come together, it's holy. Our presence together is a holy thing. And what we've given and what we've sung and what we've prayed are holy. But the most important ingredient of that is your heart before God. Are you right before God? You want to do something about any gap that you feel in that? Come right now and deal with your life before God as we stand and sing.